Hello and welcome to Red Shark TV. Coming up in the show, we'll be talking to Strongbox, who make the world's most powerful PC workstation. And then we'll be talking to Chris Waddington from NewTek about how the live TV production scene has changed in the last 10 years. In between those, we'll be having a look at the results of the Red Shark Awards. Well, we're really happy to have uh, Strongbox Systems here with us today. They make some of the fastest workstations in the world, if not the fastest PC workstations. And we've got Brian here. Thanks hey for coming, Brian. Thanks for um, it's an incredible looking piece. Inside here, we've got liquid cooling, we've got fans, massive heat sinks, all the things that you'd expect to see uh, in a, a really top end workstation. What is it that actually distinguishes this from a typical, um, you know, more generic type of workstation that people want, might want to buy to do video editing or, or 3D rendering? It's a combination of uh, the components, basically. Um, we use uh, the highest end components. Um, our motherboards use 12K capacitors and they're tested in ambient temperatures of 112 degrees centigrade um, to run for seven days. Uh, without breaking. Our CPUs are Extreme Edition CPUs, um, all uh, verified and guaranteed by Intel. But all of these things, presumably uh, other manufacturers could, could use those same parts. So how, how is it that you know, this machine is even faster? Not, not just a bit faster, but like way faster from what you've been telling me. So we use a custom BIOS. And what that enables us to do is to run the CPU at high gigahertz without adding any extra voltage. Um, and the CPU doesn't throttle back like uh, the majority of other manufacturers. So how is it that the CPU doesn't just burn up or go wrong? That comes down to the cooling that we use. So we use either closed loop custom water cooling or we use a, an open loop like this one here. So it's a combination of your specially written bias and uh, the cooling. When we say it's the fastest workstation you can buy, you seem very confident about that. What, what is it, you know, what, what benchmarks have you run and what experience have you had that makes you confident to say this is the fastest PC workstation you can buy? We ran all the, uh, the usual benchmarks um, for um, applications like Maya, so Specs app, um, Benchwell for uh, Maxwell render, mm. Octane render as well. Um, and also we let these machines go out in the field to be tested um, by professional uh, production companies. Um, basically it's a feedback that comes back from them, um, which gives us the confidence to know that we are the fastest. And the reason why is because they test it against their best of the best. Yeah, so this is not some esoteric, uh, you know, highly um, contrived benchmark you're no. talking about. This is real world Real experience. world testing, yeah. yeah. Which of course is the best yeah. type. So can you give me an example of how much faster this might be than, the, again, a generic workstation? So um, in a real flow um, fluid simulation test, um, we cut a render frame down from two and a half uh, hours down to five minutes. Um, in another um, fluid simulation test, uh, we cut the render time down from 45 hours down to 15 hours. But what, what kind of system were, were we comparing this with, the, what, the ones that were so much slower? HPZs, A40s, dual Xeons, normally 24 cores, um, and our 8-core systems are absolutely destroying them. Uh, staying in the real world so that we can see, you know, see what kind of perspective this fits into, mm -hmm. What would be the benefits, say, to uh, a video editor? Would it be that they can edit in a higher re resolution, let's say 8K as opposed to 4K, or 4K with more streams as opposed to HD? So with video editing, you've got a smooth UI. Mm -hmm. um, scrubbing through the timeline is uh, seamless. There's no jerkiness, um, which, which definitely adds to, the, um, to creativity and doesn't stop that flow. Mm -hmm. um, you can have multiple streams. Um, because we use NVMe storage drives Can as a cache. Can you just explain cache. NVMe? So um, NVMe is basically the next generation of SSD and the super SSD, which basically was a bit of a failure. Um, 
we also use uh, M.2 dot cards, um, which are, are extremely small. They were designed originally for laptops to replace yeah. SSDs to be low power. Um, but basically we use them as a cache drive and we can get 2200 meg megabytes a second out of them. Um, that's 2.2 gigabytes? That's 2.2 gigabytes, yeah. Um, and our NVMe drives are 3 gigabytes, but mm. we can RAID 0 of them together. So um, you can have 9 gigabytes, So these are, these are enormous numbers, but what does it mean Huge. In, um, in practice? It means that the computer is not sitting and waiting for the data to be loaded into RAM. So you can use it instantly. Mm. Also with rendering as well, um, the CPU um, doesn't have to stop its cycles and wait for okay. more data to come yeah, across. Yeah, it can process at the rate it wants to. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think a lot of people don't realize that a lot of processes sit there idle mm. because they're just waiting for the rest of the system to catch up. Yeah. And this is, this is one of the reasons that hyper-threading is, is so effective, because it can make use, hopefully, of these redundant cycles. What we find is that multiple cores doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to have a faster system. Okay. Yeah. So because a, a lot of video editing is still stuck in the, the old days of single-threaded applications. They still have, for some reason, developers just haven't made that jump. It's probably because of the um, intricacies of the extra programming and stuff like that. It's a different way of thinking, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So, if you have a 24-core best of the best Xeon and you have a quad-core um, CPU with a higher gigahertz, the higher gigahertz will always win. Mm. So you can, buy, you can go out and buy a chip for uh, 100 quid and basically that will trounce all over that 2,600 uh, pounds worth of uh, Xeon chips all day long. It's just because it purely needs high gigahertz. So you've taken a very pragmatic approach to this, which is what are the components that actually perform best with these real tasks? Yes, yes. Yeah. All, all our systems are, are basically designed for application purposes. So um, like, for example, DaVinci Resolve, you know, which is a huge grading program. Mm. But um, you can go out and buy a DaVinci, uh, DaVinci machine and they will say that you need 128 gig of RAM and you know, multiple uh, Xeon CPUs and stuff like that. But in actual testing, you don't. And there's a, a little secret, which is um, DaVinci doesn't actually use more than 16 gig of RAM. It's purely based on GPU power. Uh, of course, when it comes to rendering, you know, you need, you need a, yes. a decent CPU. But uh, most people will just hit render and just go off for the night or whatever. Um, so a smooth UI, multiple GPUs, 40 lanes of PCI, PCIe lanes, um, driving four GPUs at times 16 rate, that's, that's where you want the power. And the thing is the Xeons just won't do that. They won't allow the GPUs to have that breathing space. Professional software can be very picky about the hardware mm -hmm. it runs on. I mean, Resolve needs to find the right graphics card. Um, lots of other applications need to just be comfortable with, with what they're running on. And so when you mention things like a, a kind of custom BIOS mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, a, a, different, a different than mainstream approach to this, uh, how compatible is this with, with you know, the, the, the main professional packages that people like to use? So we make sure that's 100% compatible. And the way we do it is we bring it out into the field and we let people test it for a yeah. month, basically in a, in a professional environment. Um, and we work directly with them. Uh, we haven't had any problems so far in over a year. Um, so, yeah. OK, well, I'm very impressed. Um, you know, these things are real. Uh, we've looked at them. They, they seem to work uh, brilliantly. How do people get in touch with you if they want to uh, buy one? Um, so uh, just contact us through the website, strongboxtechnology.com. Um, or alternatively, you can ring our, our phone number, 0845 888 Or some combination of <laughs> yeah. those numbers, yeah. Brian, thanks very much indeed. Thanks, Dave. 
Now I'd just like to talk about the Red Shark Awards, which we held for the first time in September at IBC. We put together a panel of judges. Uh, these are esteemed people who work in the industry and they chose the best product in 12 categories. For example, best cinema camera, best drone and so on. Then as a result of that, we gave those category winners to the Red Shark readers and asked them to pick the best in the show. So the Red Shark Readers Award went to Black Magic for their Da Vinci Resolve 12, which is an amazing product. It's come on in leaps and bounds over the last two years or so, and uh, it's a well-deserved award. But most importantly, it's, it's chosen by the readers. So there's no possibility of any bias or influence in this. In that, in that sense, it's the most valid of awards uh, in the whole show. Uh, so well done to Blackmagic for that. Now, we're going to talk to Chris Waddington from NewTek. He's in San Antonio, and we're going to talk to him about how the world of live TV production has changed over the last few years. Chris, thanks very much for joining us. And, um, Thank you. Uh, you're, I understand you're in Texas, San Antonio. I am indeed, yes, yes. Uh, coming to you from our corporate headquarters over in San Antonio in Texas. Okay, fantastic. And that's a nice looking studio you're, you're in. Is that, is that a real studio or is that a virtual studio? It's one of our virtual studios. It's, uh, we're using the, the TriCaster uh, to come to you and we, uh, I'm actually sat in front of a green screen at the moment. Uh, just a, a couple of small lights uh, in and around the studio, uh, green screen behind me and uh, yeah. We've, uh, with the power of the TriCaster, we've been able to drop me into one of uh, our impressive looking virtual sets. It does look absolutely gorgeous, so uh, uh, well done for that. Um, I, I'm, I'm glad you're here because uh, I've been thinking about how uh, live video production has evolved over the last decade or so. And as we all know, the technology has romped forward to the current state of the art, which is where you're sitting. and. I, I just wondered if um, you could join me in thinking about what it was like 10, 15 years ago. So what would you have needed you know, a decade, decade and a half ago if you wanted to have a live multi-camera uh, production with the ability to record it um, and essentially do the kind of thing we're doing today? Some of it wouldn't have been possible at all. But what kind of equipment would you have needed then as opposed to now? Wow. I mean, there are some still some core pieces of technology that even today, of course, you need, you know, if you want to do a multi-camera shoot, you need to have more than one camera and, uh, and obviously lighting and sound. But a lot of the core video equipment um, has really been either completely replaced or it has been condensed into much smaller, uh, more cost effective integrated systems. Um, I mean, just 10, 15 years ago, you know, to, to do what we're doing now um, would have required a huge team of people um, and a considerable amount of investment in the cost of hardware technology. Um, you know, you would need a, a, you know, a live production switcher, a, you know, a, a video mixer, the ability to cut and mix between cameras. Um, you would have needed a graphic system if you wanted to do any kind of titles. You know, if you wanted to do what we're doing now with a virtual set, a whole dedicated rack of equipment um, just to generate the virtual set and to obviously replace the green with, um, you know, with that virtual backdrop. Um, and just, you know, the sheer cost um, not just from a financial perspective on the equipment, but also everything else around it. So including all of the cabling and the infrastructure, um, the cost of the, the people actually operating the equipment as well, because you generally needed you know, a very large team. Each member of that team was dedicated to one particular role. Um, and of course, the fact we're now actually communicating over Skype, you know, this 10 years ago just would not have been possible. We would have needed a satellite uplink, um, you know, so the, the whole way to produce video content has changed dramatically um, and of course you know new tech is, is is one of the thought leaders in the, in being able to take all of these individual pieces of equipment and condense those down into just one or two individual systems um, and then that makes it also from an expense uh, perspective you know it makes it far more cost effective but it also means that individuals now um, have the ability to, or a smaller team of people, have the ability to create 
fantastic looking shows without having to, you know, to rely on having a, um, a team of people and to also go through all the process of training all of those individual operators um, to understand how each of the different pieces of the equipment kind of fits together. Um, you know, nowadays there's, there's integrated systems, of course, such as the ones that, that we produce that really make it um, so that anyone that has an internet connection, uh, a camera, uh, potentially a TriCaster, um, ultimately has a voice and is able to communicate and reach, if you like, a global audience, which is just something that you could not have conceived 10, 15 years ago. It just, it just would not have been possible. So it, it sounds to me like um, we're looking at a reduction in cost of about between 10 and 100 times, especially when you factor in, as you mentioned, all the crew um, and yeah. the, the hardware, the cabling, the graphics generators, mm -hmm. yeah. all of this stuff, you could easily find any one of those pieces of equipment costing forty, fifty thousand uh, dollars oh, and to, well, with the TriCaster Mini now, we're, we're, we're looking at the, but, you know, something that costs much less than a small car. Yes, exactly. And also the fact that it's so small and so portable, you know, I mean, I, I can take a, I can take a, a three, um, sorry, a TriCaster Mini with me uh, on a flight. I can take it in as hand luggage. I can take it in a little backpack. I can have my cameras. Uh, I can even uh, fold away a little green screen in there as well. So I, I really have a truly, truly uh, portable system. And just using that one system, I can go to any location in the world. I can set up my camera, set up my green screen, and within just five or ten minutes I can be broadcasting and I can be broadcasting to like I said a global audience it, you know it may be one individual that I just want to communicate with you know it may be a, an internal corporate um, communication that I'm doing or maybe some internal training or it may be that I want to broadcast a breaking news story from around the globe and I want to be able to uh, broadcast that instantly to as many people and not just broadcasting that over the web, you know, you may want to be able to broadcast that through traditional, you know, television means. And of course, we have the power of social media now. So you may want to be able to put live broadcasts and breaking news out on Twitter, Facebook and a whole host of social media platforms as well. Um, because the way that people are consuming content and the way that people are looking to um, receive that information really has fundamentally changed. I mean, obviously, there's uh, a large population of people, including myself, that will still, from time to time, you know, sit around um, a television set um, and actually watch live television as it happens. But, you know, with yourself and myself, when we travel so much, you know, a lot of the time, we'll have a phone, we'll have a tablet, we'll have a computer system. Um, and so we're not watching content in the traditional sense, if you like, uh, when we now have access to content anytime, anywhere. And so the ability to have just one or two pieces of equipment that enable you to broadcast anytime, anywhere um, is also meeting really a, a need from um, the consumer or indeed the global audience because their viewing habits have changed. And so the way that we have to adapt, respond and be able to, uh, to create technologies and, and uh, solutions um, has to change along with that as well. So really in a sense what we're talking about here with live video production is analogous to what's happened with cameras, video cameras, which, which is we're seeing a democratization of filmmaking with cameras because you can buy cinema quality cameras for one hundredth of what they cost 10 or 15 years ago. And the same kind of thing is happening with uh, live production and of course with the with the uh, TriCaster Mini, it has HDMI inputs. Uh, there's no difference in quality between SDI and HDMI, it's just that HDMI is found on consumer level equipment up to prosumer. And so, you could, as you mentioned, you can take the TriCaster Mini with you on a plane and then plug in whatever cameras happen to be around, as long as they have an HDMI output. Exactly. You know, you, you no longer need to be a, a broadcast or, a, you know, a video professional to create great looking content. And, and part of that is, is the technology because, you know, taking something like a HDMI interface, um, which is, I mean, it's prevalent. It's on practically every single device that will either output or receive a, uh, a audio and video signal nowadays. So the fact that, say, with the TriCaster Mini, um, we have a, a device that you can literally go out into the world and you can you know, grab almost any camera off the shelf and you can plug that in. And there's a 
you know, a, a plethora of other video devices, you know, computer-based systems now, you know, a lot of the time when we're wanting to broadcast and we want to communicate, um, you know, we may want to bring in content from what you would consider to be non-traditional video devices. So that may be computer-based systems, it could be mobile devices, phones, tablets, you know, a lot of the time we want to show video content that may be um, available only on a website. And so, you know, Today's technology means that we can do that either with a wire or potentially even without a wire. Um, you know, the TriCaster Mini has wireless technologies, so you can connect a number of devices um, without having to go out and you know and actually physically connect uh, the cables together. But it's that it's that shift in technology that means that you do not need to be. Um, you know, a broadcast engineer, you do not necessarily need to understand what the differences are. And, you know, coming from a, a broadcast background myself, you know, I understand, you know, a lot of the differences when you, you know, you, you pick up all these different types of cables we've used over the years from composite to component to YCS video. SDI, um, you know, there's a huge plethora of different connection types. And the challenge then is, you know, you to be able to put the ability to have anyone in the world create great looking video, you have to break down a lot of those barriers. And to do that, you know, HDMI is a great technology because it is a device which everyone is familiar with, you know, whether you're trying to hook up a PlayStation or an Xbox to the back of a television, um, or you're trying to take your, uh, you know, your video camera and you want to go around and, and again, connect that to a, a display device. Um, having one universal connection is, hugely beneficial because you like I said you don't need to worry about the different types of connections and do you have this adapter or this cable or you know is it analog is it digital you plug in all your devices um, you know via HDMI and away you go and you know new tech as a company we do make obviously a lot of professional based systems and you know when we started um, when the first TriCaster came out in 2005 it actually had what we would consider consumer grade uh, video connections on it and over the years of course we you know we revised uh, the TriCaster we added more features we added more inputs and over time we added those professional video connections and it's almost it's quite interesting um, that you know the TriCast has just had its 10th birthday and we've kind of come full circle again and we've gone from what originally was a small box and it, and it grew and grew and grew um, back to the Mini which again is a very small, I mean it's even more portable than the very first TriCast that, that we launched 10 years ago um, but it's a small portable unit and it, it, it has if you like a consumer grade video connection which means that yeah you know you do not have to be a professional and go out and spend tens and hundreds and, and you know potentially even millions of pounds euros dollars whatever on professional broadcast equipment you can take um, a relatively cost-effective camera um, which may only cost a couple of hundred or a few hundred and you will still get great looking video from that plug that into the menu uh, the mini hit one single button and you can be broadcasting to the world. Now, while we're talking about bringing material in from the rest of the world you know, via all kinds of uh, formats, um, one area I know that uh, New Tech is looking very actively is video over IP, which sounds like a like really dry, boring IT related topic, but what it actually means for everyday users is very very exciting because essentially it means that you can plug existing or future equipment into a simple nothing special network and you'll be able to connect with a TriCaster or other network or IP video enabled equipment uh, and just treat that as if it's plugged in locally. I mean this seems to me a tremendously exciting development. It is. It is, to be honest with you. I mean, we at IBC this year, uh, we announced a, a brand new technology, um, which is actually really a, an evolution of, of what we've been doing. Uh, I mean, IP to new tech isn't new. We, we've been doing this um, since 2005. Again, going back to the very first TriCaster, it actually had an IP input. Um, and so we've continued to, to kind of push the envelope, if you like, and, and, and develop those technologies. Um, and this year um, at IBC, we launched NDI. And NDI uh, is actually something, it's a technology which, if you like, is actually bigger than new tech because uh, we're actually opening up NDI and making it available. So any company uh, and any individual that wants to um, take our uh, NDI technology and add that into their product or into their workflow um, is able to do that without actually paying any cost. Um, it's a, you know it's it's going to be available for free. Um, so it's it's a very powerful technology and ultimately yes it means that you can take um, you know we may have 
at the moment, the way that current systems work, even with, with the Mini, um, is the vast majority of pieces of equipment that connect to the Mini have to be local to the Mini. So if they're cameras, um, you know, you, you have to bring your Mini along with you, your cameras, you plug them all up, SDI, HDMI, whatever the video connection is going to be. Um, with NDI and the IP workflow um, that we are making available um, through, with the TriCaster, it will be through uh, TriCaster Ad Advanced Edition, uh, means that you can take these individual pieces of technology and they no longer have to be centrally located. So as you quite rightly say, you know, you could be in a large um, broadcast facility, you could be in a school, you could be in a university, in a lecture hall, and you can have your cameras. And if they are IP enabled cameras, or NDI enabled cameras, you can take a, a video, a, a network connection, you can plug it into a, into a wall socket, and then you have the ability to have all of those videos sources coming into the TriCaster, but also have the ability for the TriCaster to also broadcast to, again, any other NDI enabled device. So it's a very powerful technology and it's something which is fundamentally changing the landscape of video production um, because you know, every device nowadays is pretty much connected to every, every other device. You know, I have a phone, I have a tablet, I have a computer, of course. I know you do. I'm sure many of the viewers that are watching this obviously have all these different, you know, internet or IP enabled devices. Um, and so from my phone, I can access anyone in the world um, through VoIP applications such as Skype. I can browse any website. I can pretty much access any other device. And when that happens, a fundamental shift changes because it makes the world a much smaller place. And so we're taking that same, if you like, that same concept and rolling that out into the video uh, domain. Um, and so what that will mean is, you know, you won't necessarily have to be just limited by physical distance or physical connection anymore. You know, if I could be in a lecture theater, I can have some cameras, I can plug those into, uh, into the wall socket, I could have my TriCaster in a completely different location. And so long as they're connected to the same physical network, um, then all of those video signals come into the TriCaster. And like I said, we are making this uh, NDI technology freely available. And so we ha we're working with uh, other companies to bring NDI technology into those uh, products and, uh, and you know, really making, a, uh, if you like, a, 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 an ecosystem, um, which is going to be completely transparent to anyone that really wants to, to kind of come on board or wants to be able to use our technology. Because, you know, it's really going to, it's going to allow anyone to uh, connect to almost any, any other device, so long as it's NDI, NDI enabled. Well, Chris, that's absolutely fascinating. It's very exciting. Uh, I, th I think we've run out of time, but thanks ever so much for joining us uh, and talking us through this amazing technology. Thanks a lot. We'll see you soon. My pleasure. Thank you. Well, that's it for this time. Uh, I'd like to say thank you to our guests and, of course, to all the people who sponsored us. You'll be able to see them on the screen. And we'll see you next time. <laughs>